This is a Citroen Saxo. It's a small car produced by Citroen between 1996 and 2003. This one has quite a story behind it. So if you want to hear the story, keep watching. If you don't want to hear it, then do something else. So the Saxo is really underneath, not a Citroen. It's a, well, it's a Peugeot. Let's be honest, it's a Peugeot. Uh, the car was made by Citroen, but Peugeot also produced the 106, which was mechanically and in many ways bodily the same car. For example, if someone stoves this door in, I can go to a scrapyard, get a Peugeot 106 door and bolt it on. It will fit. So the Saxo was launched in 1996. It replaced the AX, which itself hailed from 1986. Um, underneath, they are quite similar. But when the Saxo was first launched, there were no hot versions of it. It was just the basic ones. In fact, the first cars, in reg they were, the number plate ended sax, like the press demos and dealer demos and things. Those cars didn't have power steering. I remember that being a big thing. Everyone went on about it not having power steering, but of course, because it was based on a Mark I Peugeot 106, um, they didn't have power steering either. So Citroen was still working on that. The hot models didn't come until later. Early 1997 is when the production cars started and Citroen did not go the conventional route when doing the hot versions of these cars. They went a different way. Peugeot went the tried and tested way with their version of this car, the 106. They did the 106 GTI, and of course that GTI lineage carried on from the 205 and the 309 and 505. Citroen went a completely different way. They had used the GTI name before, but they dropped it. The ZX was the last hot hatch they made before this, and that was just called the ZX 16 valve, a bit like the BX 16 valve. They didn't do just the Saxo 16 valve. They did the Saxo VTR, and VTS. Why did they do this? Well, the reason they went for VTR and VTS was basically to try and reduce the insurance groups um, because VTR or VTS to an insurance company means nothing. Whereas GTI sounds a bit, ooh, spicy. So they didn't do that. They went VTR, VTS, we'll start from scratch, we'll come up with something. Now there were two versions, as I say, VTR, VTS. VTR is what this is. Vitesse Tre Riche? and then Vitesse Tre Sportif, I don't know. Basically, one was a hot hatch and one was a warm hatch. So by hot, I mean larry and fast, and by warm, I mean not so larry and fast, but a little bit more spicy than a normal Saxo. So the VTR was the warm version of the two. It was the slightly cooler one. And this worked because the VTR had an insurance group rating of seven, which is actually really low. The AX GT that came before it with 85 horsepower was group nine. Um, the VTS on the other hand, well, that had more power and the VTS badge didn't really pull the wool over the insurance company's eyes because that ended up group 14, which is quite high. Um, but the VTR was where Citroen saw their money. And to be honest, it was a stroke of genius. The VTR worked. By and large, the VTR and the VTS looked pretty much the same. Um, this is a slightly later car, we'll get onto that in a minute, but visually they had the same body kit. Originally they had the same wheels. The only real difference on the outside was the VTS had an S, where this one's got an R, and sometimes it was yellow, and they had a little 16 valve badge here, which was actually the same 16 valve badge just taken from the ZX. 16 valve, not many people know that. Um, other than that, from the outside they were pretty much the same. Underneath the changes, there were more changes underneath, but not a crazy amount. The VTR had, or the VTS, I should say, had a very slightly fatter rear anti-roll bar. No idea why. Uh, it had ABS. It had an optional passenger airbag, which means you didn't get a glove box. Um, what else did it have? Rear headrests. And the VTS had different gauges. It had the same speedo and rev counter, although the red line had moved. It also had an oil temperature gauge, which the VTR does not have. The biggest difference between the VTR and VTS was what's under the bonnet, because the VTR had an eight valve TU engine. TU engine being the family of engines that came from the well, mid eighties really in PSA language or mid to late eighties. The AX had used TU engines, the 106 was using TU engines, last BX 14s used TU engines. The Saxo used an eight valve 1.6 litre version of that engine, which means it got an iron block, not an alloy block. Um, it was based on the engine from the 106 XSI, which originally had started off as a 1.4 with an iron block with high compression pistons before moving to a lower compression 1.6 um, in about 1994, I think 1995. So it's basically that engine there, all those slightly detuned. 
Um, the rev limit on a VTR was only about 6,000. It didn't rev very high. It was more torquey, to be honest. I say torquey, it didn't have loads of torque. It just, it was quite a mid-rangey engine, quite a flexible engine. It wasn't really a, a rip snorter. Whereas the VTS kind of was. The VTS was the same engine, but with a different cylinder head. 16 valves, hydraulic tappets, two camshafts. It revved to 7,000 and something. I don't know what. I never look at the gauge when it hits the limiter. It's about 7,200, 7,300, something like that. The VTR made 90 horsepower, the VTS 120. And more torque as well. This is a big thing. People think VTR was torquier. It wasn't. What it meant was that the eight valve, 90 horsepower engine in the VTR could propel the VTR from 0 to 16, about 9.9. .9 conveniently just under 10 seconds, whereas Citroen's book figure for the VTS was 7.2 seconds to 60, which seems pretty quick. So the VTR and the VTS go on sale in 1997. Not a year later, they're facelifted. The grille changes very slightly. The rear lights change very slightly. The trim inside changes very slightly. Why? Who knows, but they did. They continued being popular, and this is when it really kicked off. Citroen realised they'd played a bit of a blinder because they'd created a car that people really liked. They loved the look of this car, the VTR and VTS. People were buying these cars up quickly. People were buying these cars and modifying them, young people. It was almost replacing the Nova in culture. It was really popular. In fact, the VTR and VTS combo were the, most, were the best selling hot hatches in the UK for a number of years. I think it was three years. Now, some of that popularity was down to the genius masterstroke Citroen also did with marketing and with offers because you could get these cars cheap and some of them came with free insurance. Not all of them. The VTS didn't often come with free insurance, but at the times it did, they tended to lose money. I wonder why. Do you want a car that's tough and durable? Try the Citroen Saxo. Available with two years free insurance. It's the ideal safety package. And even if you couldn't get free insurance, they quite often give you a contribution towards the insurance. They even set up their own little insurance company to do it, which is underwritten by somebody. Don't know who. Max Power magazine and Fast Car and all that lot, they took these to their hearts. These cars became one of the best cars to modify of the 90s, if not the best car to modify of the 90s. You could buy anything for these things. You could buy different wheels, you could buy different body kits, different seats, different radio. Well, that's pretty simple, really, but people were putting different engines in them. People were grafting different back ends onto them. People were filling them full of speakers. You could buy suspension, you could buy brakes, you could buy tuning parts for the engine. You could buy carbon fiber bits for the bodywork. You could buy roll cages. You could buy different mirrors. You could buy a different cap to go on the mirror to replace the original one. So you could take this off and put a different shape one on. Citroen realized that they had really, really lucked into it. So much so they even introduced a cheaper version of this. They called it the West Coast. It had the same body kit. It had the same front suspension and the same front brakes, but it only had a 1.4 liter engine. The interior was basic and the back axle was not the same as this one. VTRs and VTSs have rear disc brakes and a slightly wider axle. The, v the West Coast used the standard axle, which means that the wheels were buried inside the arches and they looked a bit silly. They also had steel wheels, not alloys. The West Coast eventually was replaced by the Furio, um, which I had. I bought one of those, new. Um, they had, you know, West Coast and the Furia, most of them had multicolour seat belts. They'd have a different colour seat belt on each corner. Later in the 90s, the VTS received 15 inch alloy wheels. The ones taken from a Zara VTR Coupe, the 1.8 version, not the 1.6 version, which used steel wheels, but was still a VTR. I don't know why. The differences between VTR started to become more pronounced because people were playing on the fact that VTR was cheap and less people were buying the VTS because of the increased insurance costs and everything and the fact that it cost them more to make them because it had more bespoke parts in it than a VTR, which by and large was fairly run of the mill. The VTR was updated at that point. Um, briefly, it received the silver top version of the engine. Basically means the rocker cover is silver, not black. That means that it's got roller rockers inside um, to help reduce camshaft wear and friction, which is not really something the TU ever suffered with, but they did that. Thanks in no part to Citroen's marketing and the deals and the insurance and the max power generation taking this car to their heart, there were at their peak on the UK roads, 41,000 Saxo VTRs. You don't know if that's a lot or not, do you? Okay, let's put it another way. Citroen C6, how many of those do you think they produced in total? 23,000 worldwide. 
the VTS was much rarer, 6,800 at its peak. However, contrary to popular belief, people seem to think that the VTR was more popular than the VTS, but the 106 GTI was more popular than the VTS as well. So it kind of went VTR, 106 GTI, then VTS. Not so, 6,800 VTSs were on the road, 5,500 106 GTIs. When you look at those numbers, 1,600 rallies, 5,500 106 GTIs, 6,800 VTSs, 41,000 VTRs. You can see how successful this car was. At the end of summer 1999, the Saxo was facelifted and what became the Mark II, or became known as the Mark II, came out. And this is one of those cars. Mark II, different front end, bug eye lights, all in one piece, glass, not plastic different front end, kind of a little bit more fitting into their corporate look. They also facelifted the Zara not long after that. God, they did a hatchet job on that. The lights changed at the back. The indicators became basically white. They were progressively getting lighter and lighter and lighter in their tint until they became white. The interiors changed as well. And this is the point where the VTS and the VTR really started to split because the VTS got more plush, if anything. It got side um, airbags mounted into the seat. It got a higher quality interior trim. Um, the VTR got a lower quality interior trim. In fact, the fabric from the VTR, when it was facelifted to the Mark II, came from one of the basic Xantias. It was quite low rent. They started leaving plastic covers off things. They started not putting bits of trim in to try and save costs. On the flip side, they were less than £10,000. When they first came out, it was about £10,500 for a VTR and just under thirteen for a VTS. But by the time the Mark II came out, it was less. You could buy these for £9,900, £9,800. A couple of years later, uh, late 2000, early 2001, all cars were updated to Euro 3 compliance, which means the cars had different ECUs, um, the VTS got an EGR system, and all the eight valve models got a downpipe based catalytic converter. Um, the VTR actually gained from this. It went to 98 horsepower instead of 90. They gave it a little boost. That's kind of them, wasn't it? The funny thing with that, actually, in terms of the VTS, is that if you get a VTS in the UK, which is Y Reg or newer, meaning it's 2001 or newer, it costs more to tax it than it does older cars because that's when they changed the tax bans and started figuring out road tax or road fund license on emissions. The ironic thing is that the later Saxo VTS, the last ones after y Reg, are cleaner. That's fair, isn't it? Because UK. Now the Saxo was killed off in 2003, originally um, by the arrival of the C3, which kind of took over the five door Saxo sales and then the C2, which took over the young person's funky three door Saxo sales. Were any of them as good as the Saxo? No, I don't think so. The Saxo was the last small Citroen to feature the kind of Peugeot DNA independent rear torsion bar suspension setup. The C2, C3, twist beam. <laughs> twist beams or coil spin. No, rubbish. Didn't handle anything like as well as these. Um, a lot heavier as well. But then, of course, cars had to get cleaner, cars had to get safer. It might be fair to say that the Saxo became a victim of its own success because that popularity in Mac power culture and lad culture and everything like that in the sort of 90s and noughties, well, it worked against it as well. It kind of gave it that chav image that the Nova previously enjoyed. Um, the Nova is now becoming a classic car, so maybe one day. The fact that the, the kind of people who bought these cars were the sort of people who would put McDonald's trays under the back wheels, yank the handbrake up, pretend they were donutting. I didn't, honestly, I didn't do that. I did not do anything like that. Furios do have better handbrake turns than VTRs because of the drum. Anyway, so they became a victim of their own success. They become a bit of a laughing stock, actually. The values on these things plummeted. They were being given away. They were being ragged. They were driven with no insurance. They were getting modified beyond God knows what. None of the mods declared. They were getting engine conversions and no one was telling DVLA and of course, Basically, you go through that kind of clientele, um, you end up with not many nice original cars at the end of it. So the numbers are now very low. Just over 600 VTRs remain on the road. Now that doesn't sound really, really rare. Uh, just over 600. 41,000 there were, like 20 years ago. Just over 20 years ago. 41,600. Part of the reason for that is these things rust. Doesn't look like it, does it? Underneath. Underneath, oh man, they rust.
Citroen Saxo VTS is a Saxo, but with a bit of the devil inside it. So you may well be watching this thinking, wow, this is all really interesting, hopefully. Um, probably not. What's so special about this car? Well, the first thing to note about this car is that the fact that it's a Saxo isn't actually pivotal to this story at all. It could be anything. It could be a Toyota Starlet. It could be a Fiesta. It could be a Vauxhall Tigra, the ugly one with the balloon. Actually, no, they're all ugly, aren't they? Why am I saying that? In fact, the early one's probably better looking. Anyway, this car was built in September 1999, the 25th of September 1999. That makes it a very, very rare Mark II because in the UK it's on a V-plate. Most Mark IIs aren't on a V-plate, but the Mark II only came out less than a month before this car was built, which makes this car probably one of the earliest Mark IIs left in the UK. If there's only 600 of them about going through all the years of production, 1997 to 2003, probably quite a rare car, that one. Um, we don't fully understand how this one came about. It has a Citroen UK plate on the back, was registered in Coventry, but has spent all its life down south. So I don't know what's happened there. Maybe someone who worked in the trade will know, but that's kind of interesting about this car but not you know it's got um, a lot of mark one parts and it. it's got the mark one carpet still because they didn't change that until like three months after mark two production started there's lots of things in it that are kind of mark one that you think oh why are they in there if you're a saxo geek but no that's not the special thing it's kind of interesting if you're a nerd but it's not the thing now other than the fact that at some point between when this car was sold and when this car was purchased by my wife in 2004 it had, um, well, we found out last night, actually, we read about it. It had a number of breakdowns in the space of a week. The person who owned this car had a really bad time that week. He broke down many times and had garages throwing parts cannons at it. Um, it they also, at some point, somebody had a front ender in it, which is why the bonnet is chipped and horrible and doesn't line up very well, because it's a non-genuine bonnet. The front end got stoved in. I've discovered this after I met her. Um, she hadn't noticed. <laughs> Um, yeah, that all happened before she bought the car. She bought the car in 2004 in January to, well, originally to go to uni, uh, to drive to uni in. Um, she was looking at cars. She wanted a Saxo VTS. Well, she wanted the Saxo VTS originally, but uh, couldn't afford the insurance on it. Thought I'll go for a VTR instead. Um, her father tried talking, well, her father tried talking her into a Ford because he didn't even like Citroens. He hated them. So, um, yeah, he was a bit just, just disappointed that she ended up with this, but he wanted her to get like a West Coast or something like that. Less power, basically, a bit safer for your kid. Totally understandable, but no, she wanted a VTR. So she was looking at the Mark 1s and things like that, all the P-Reg and R-Reg cars out there, slightly leggy and everything. And then all of a sudden, this V-Reg Mark 2 popped up, not far away. And the price of it, it was pretty cheap. So she went, she bought. And that became her car to drive to uni in and go to work experience, which was up in Farnborough somewhere. Her previous car, which was, a Vauxhall Nova. <laughs> I know, I know, you couldn't write it, could you? It was a Vauxhall Nova SR, uh, her first car. She, they didn't trust that, um, which is probably because the front end was trying to, trying to detach um, from the mechanical elements of the car. It was all trying to separate, um, as the MOT man told her. So she got this car as a fresh-faced 18-year-old little girl racer. She put on Chevy number plate surrounds, wiper, fins, all that crap, um, as you do. Now, although we didn't become romantically involved straight away, we met in January 2005 because I was selling a book. I know, a Saxo owner can read. No, it had pictures as well. Yeah, I mean, it's typical, isn't it? This is that very book. That is the book I was selling, and it tells you how you can john up your Saxo like, to look like a golf. It tells you how to make a wiper, a single wiper, and how to do this to your headlights and how to make it look awful. This was cool at the time. That was in 2005. I had sold my Furio. I'd gone through a process of johnning it up and then ruining it and everything like that. And I'd sold it and I didn't need that book anymore because I had a Citroen BX at this point and that book did not apply to Citroen BXs, however much I'd tried. Now she went through a few phases in it, but because she knew me, it ended up lowered pretty quickly. It ended up with different headlights or no, actually it was the same headlights, just that the glass is often painted on black inside. It ended up with different tail lights, it had a rude boy exhaust or rude girl exhaust. It was, yeah, standard. It wasn't horrendous, but it was 
yeah it was jonned up a bit now she was enjoying things so much that it around 2006 it narrowly avoided being chopped in for another car it could have been sold uh, she'd owned it a couple of years at this point could have been sold for a vts um she was she had her eye on a vts she was enjoying this been on the road a couple more years insurance was now more achievable wanted to buy a vts didn't it dodged a bullet it stayed in 2006 rimmer stroked the bonnet that sounds weird doesn't it no genuinely the man who played rimmer uh, chris barry uh, he did a TV programme called Massive Speed, which is quite a crap name when you think about it. I guess he didn't come up with that himself, but he did a TV programme called Massive Speed, and they were looking for a saxo. They wanted a normal saxo and a John Up saxo. The normal saxo they were supposed to use couldn't make it. She'd already said, oh, well, you, you can use me as a backup or whatever. They got in touch and said, can you get that saxo to Oxfordshire? Stat we need to film it. So she drove up in this. This was slammed at the time. It was lower than the John Duck one next to her, which had all the body kit and flip paint and stereo and everything like that in it. And so this car um, went to the airfield and he did talk about it like this before walking off to the car next to it to say, this is what hot hatches are now. Like he was talking, I think he was saying like how hot hatches used to be about having fun and going fast and everything. And then after a while, it became more about johnning them up because people couldn't afford to insure them anymore or something like that. So yeah, it was on TV, 2006. Now by this point, we were romantically involved and we had moved in together. She was thinking of chopping in the Saxo again because she's had it a while now and it is only a VTR and she's getting on. Well, she's not getting on, she was late, early 20s, but she was like, no, I wanna move on to the next thing now. You know, the next thing was likely to be either a Fiat Coupe 20 valve turbo or a Renault Clio 172. But the Saxo dodged being chopped in yet again because we bought a TVR instead. We took out a loan. Instead of trying to save for a house deposit, we, we took out a loan. We, uh, we bought a TVR Chimera because um, they are quite cheap. Everyone went, how the hell did you afford that car? And you think, well, it's less than your Fiesta. So that's how. And she needed a cheap, reliable, sensible car to use as a daily car to drive to her job at a Citroen dealer. So we bought the TVR. It didn't really make sense to sell the Saxo. These front arches aren't original. Uh, the original ones were stolen by Chavs um, in 2008. These are actually green arches uh, that have been resprayed. The paint is now starting to flake because the bird pooed on it and we didn't notice. Um, these were resprayed quite a long time ago and I fitted them to the car with lots of glue and some randomly assorted sharp pieces of metal inside which will penetrate Chavs fingers should they try to nick them again. Speaking of Chav behavior, uh, it had a private plate on the front for a little while, M3 VTR. That plate is now for sale, so please don't feel offended the fact I've just suggested that you're a chav if you have a private plate. Uh, that plate is now for sale. I'm not calling you a chav, it's just if you're interested, because we don't have it on there anymore. But that plate was fun. Why was that plate fun? I will tell you. The reason that plate was fun was quite simply because in 2009, I did to this car what she had told me that she always wanted to be done to this car because she wanted a Saxo VTS but she had become sentimentally attached to this car and basically said well the ideal solution would be a VTS engine in this car that is a VTS engine I had a Saxo VTS back in somewhere and it was r rusted out basically it was really really rotten so i had two options either to try and fix it or to um break it for parts and keep the engine so we sold the engine that was in this car which is actually in good condition and this car received the full conversion from that car so basically it wasn't just like an engine and then twist some wires together to make it work the engine bay loom and everything came out of it and because this was such an early mark ii it only had or only has what is known as a single plug ECU, the th triple plug, the three plug ECU, um, is the later cars, the Aero 3 cars. So because this is an early one, we kind of like Mark 1 running gear, the Mark 1 engine, this is from an R-Edge Mark 1 Saxo VTS, the Mark 1 running gear uh, came from it. And um, the only things that didn't fit was the airbox, and the box itself did, but the intake pipe to it didn't because the slam panel on a Mark 2 is different. Um, the coolant fan does fit, but as you can see, it would be quite easy to swiss cheese your fingers because on a Mark 1 that would be covered. So that's not a Mark 1 cooling fan, it's a Mark 2 cooling fan, but otherwise all of this came out of the VTS. And that means it goes much faster than it did. The 
the reason that's fun is because if your number plate says M3 VTR and you chance across someone who goes, oh, there's a Chevrolet Saxo with a private plate, uh, and it says VTR on it, and they know from their max power days, that means you've only got 90 horsepower. It was a good little sleeper. In fact, for reasons I am not completely aware, this car kicks out 128 horsepower. It's not tuned. I, I, as far as I know, it's completely standard. Um, no idea. In fact, once it did 132, but I put that down to a lucky day. Um, yeah, no idea why it does that, but it does. It kicks out 128 horsepower. It does ha also have the VTS gearbox. The VTR and the VTS did actually use the same gearbox, and there's a bit of a myth. People think they've got different gear ratios. They don't. They have a different final drive. The diff output ratio on the VTS is shorter. People would say, oh, that's a bad thing, isn't it? No, it's not. A VTR only revs to 6,000, 6,200, something like that. VTS, 7.3, 7.2, 7.4, something like that. It revs a lot more. So although the gearing's shorter, you've got another 1,000 revs to play with, which means you can make the gearing shorter, rev a bit higher to make up that difference, and with the shorter gearing, it will give you quicker acceleration. The gear ratios in a VTS and a VCR are actually the same as an AXGT and a 106 Rally and everything. It's just they've all got different length final drives. That's the only difference. Now, one of the other reasons I may have put this engine in here, apart from the fact that I could, because it was right there, um, is I, this became my daily for a little bit. Before this place existed, before everything. Well, no, this place existed, but this place was there in the 1800s. But before I was here, before this business existed, before this life existed, I was working somewhere else and I was using this car as a daily. So it was kind of a bit more fun to have that in there than the VTR engine because the VCR engine's a bit of a plodder. It's just an engine. It doesn't really have any, it's not fun, it's just a plodder. You can throw it, throw the VTR around, but the standard engine is just a bit, meh, meh. There are a number of people out there who go, oh, the VTR is the one you want. Mm. And that used to happen back in the day. I remember there was someone, I had an argument with a woman online, or a girl online, she would have been at the time, and she said, oh, the VCR's better anyway. No. No. No, the only people who say the VTR is better in those days were people who couldn't afford a VTS, and the only people who say a VTR is better now are people who can't find the VTS. The VTS is superior in every way. People say the VTR has more torque. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. The VTR produces its torque lower down. The outright number it produces is lower. And the gearing is taller, which means the torque produced at the wheels is even lower. This is way more, way more produced. More torque and more torque at the wheels. It's just a lot faster. It's over two seconds faster to 60 mile an hour. So the Saxo had, until this point, developed a reputation as being old reliable. A little bit like RMS Olympic. I know, I know about boats too but that's when it had the VTR engine in it. When I put the VTS engine in, it did start to cause slightly more problems than before, but it's... F okay, so I'm gonna admit something now. When I put the VTS engine in, I did VTS engine conversion in about, well, I did it in a weekend, basically a day and a half, because half of that day was spent driving to Southampton to buy a, with well, the only Saxo VTS drive shaft I could find, um, on a Saturday in stock because I had to cut the old drive shaft out because it had seized into the bearing housing in the back. So um, yeah, that basically involved that and I changed that engine in a weekend in a garage at home um, because I basically had all the bits on the floor and this, take the front end of it off in a single garage, swap it all over. Because I was racing, I was not cutting corners as such, but I was not able to do the thorough kind of job I would like to do. There is the timing cover. Please ignore this, by the way. This would normally be under here, but uh, it broke this morning. So I've got this places that I can um, access it. No, the timing belt cover here has a crack. Can you see that? This is not normally there. Why is that there, you might ask? I will tell you. The reason that crack is there is because in that weekend where I did the engine conversion, I tried to change the cam belt. I bought a cam belt kit, I bought a water pump, I bought the tensioners, I bought the belt, I bought everything. I couldn't get the cover off. And because of the extra time I'd lost in faffing around with that drive shaft, I was now running out of time. I needed this car for Monday morning. We just had twins. I mean, they were like two months old. I was not popular for doing this, but I didn't do it for me. I did it for her, it's her car. It wasn't for me. I went to do the cam belt. 
I couldn't get the cover off because the bolt in here, the original bolt, had seized. I could not get the cover off. I was getting frustrated. I was getting flummoxed and I thought, bollocks to it. I'll do it another time. I know, that's stupid. Well, it's not stupid, is it? The engine worked, not a problem. I'm sure it's all fine. So I put it all in there, button it all up. I shut the bonnet and I drive off to work the next day, happy as Larry, because I had now 120 odd horsepower and I could go around really chaving it up and living up my youth again. I had peaked at the cam belt. I had pulled the cover back a little bit and gone, it looked all right. It didn't look new, but it didn't look bad. It looked okay, not a problem. I'll do it in a couple of months. When I've got more time, I'll do it. I'll, I can get to that bolt while the engine is in the car and I can do it then. It will be fine. It was not fine. About two weeks later, I went out to get a Chinese takeaway as a treat. So I headed out in the Saxo because this is the car that was on the end of the driveway, but the Saxo needed more fuel because I'd used it all, ragging it around like a chav. So I went to the petrol station and I put fuel in it. Nothing abnormal in that, I know. Now, in order to tell this story in full, I need to tell you a little tiny story way back when when I had my original Saxo. Now for whatever reason, I'm not gonna go into it now, but for whatever reason, I had two cam belts jump on that car. Um, the first time happened on the driveway at home. And the second time happened when I had just gone to visit my dying nan. So I was in a great mood. And I drove through Winchester, I pulled into a petrol station. I pulled out of the petrol station. Ah, it's a petrol station common theme. I drove out of the petrol station through St Cross in Winchester, I got up to some traffic lights and the engine just cut out. Not, not with a shudder, not with a shake, not with a bang, not with a rattle, it just switched off. I went to turn the engine on back on, I went to start the car, crank the key and all I got was a high-pitched whirring noise and I knew what that high-pitched whirring noise was from the last time the cam belt had jumped on that car despite the fact this car is 18 months old. Don't give it, I'm just say long story. I knew the cam belt had gone. That was a great day, really, really good day that. So, but uh, yeah, fast forward to many years later, I pull out of the petrol station in this car and it cuts out. Again, it just cuts out. No shudder, no shake, no rattle, no bang. It just cuts out. And for some reason, probably because I'd been faffing about with the cam belt on it a couple of weeks earlier, it went through my head. I thought, oh, Oh no, oh no. I tentatively turned the key and it started, fine. Oh, Oof. what coincidence, <laughs> crazy. So I pulled away out of the petrol station as you would in this car, which was like a knob. I drive off, I get the takeaway, I drive back. I'm driving into our housing estate. As I pull into the housing estate, I dip the clutch to do a junction. The engine cuts out again. Oh, for God's sake, what is going on? What's causing this to cut out now? I flip the key. High pitched wearing noise. What? Cam belt had gone. 10 minutes earlier in a petrol station, it had done a fake cam belt jump or a fake cam belt snap, but hadn't. It just kept driving and it's like, you couldn't even go back and say, oh, well, maybe one of the, maybe it jumped a tooth or something like that. Maybe that was your warning. No, because it drove fine afterwards. If it had had any issue at all, it would have, it wouldn't have driven right. It would have misbehaved. The engine would have been misfiring or something. It wasn't, it drove absolutely mint. And then 10 minutes later, it did snap. Completely shredded it. 12 bent valves. Some of them very bent. So head off. And away we went. Now, I'd love to tell you that I rebuilt this engine lovingly, like a professional, but again, I was short on time. I went back into the, uh, what, what was the parts place I used to buy the parts, a whole set? Max it. Maxis? Maxis? Something like that? I bought all the parts uh, wholesale. I went on eBay. I bought a set of secondhand 106 GTI valves in a box, uh, in a bag, sorry, in a jiffy bag um, from someone, I don't know, just a set of 106 GTI valves. Thank you for whoever that was. They were about 20 quid. Covered in coke when they got here. Did I clean any of them? No. I bought all these parts. I whipped the head off. I took all the bent valves out. I saw the pistons. I saw the dents in the pistons and thought, Meh. I put the valves in. I didn't lap them in. 
I threw it back together. Absolutely threw it back together. It should have been awful, but I was really low on time. And uh, now, that engine is the engine this car has. And it absolutely purrs. It goes like a train and it produces 128 horsepower. And it was put together with no love whatsoever. If anything, it was put together with complete disregard for mechanical sympathy. When I did the head bolts up, I didn't, I didn't have an angle disc or anything like that. I was just like, that's about it. <coughs> Good girl. In 2010, I fitted 306 GTI 6 brakes to the front. I removed them a couple of years later. And in 2011, it had its first round of welding. It wasn't horrendous, it was, the, it was kind of here, this bit. In 2013, this car was the first car to go on the rolling road. If you look at the power figures on the wall there on that leaderboard, that power figure was from 2013. Maybe I should put it on again. Should I put it on again? Yeah, it was the first car to go on there. It was the first car. That, this is the car I used to learn how to use a rolling road. In 2014, it had its second round of welding and it dodged. Being, well, basically, it didn't dodge being sold, it dodged being scrapped. Um, the back end of this car was rotten. All the arches up the inside here, the seat belt mounts, everything. Oof. Bad. Chassis legs, boot floor. It's had a fairly extensive rebuild at the back end. Um, back axle came off, everything like that. It was at that point that it was raised back up to standard ride height. I put a standard back axle on it. It was also at that point I put the standard brakes back on it because the GTI 6 brakes fell off in London and we went to Hampton Court Palace and Tower of London, took the Saxo into London and the brakes fell off. It was good. I, would like, I wouldn't say it's my fault, but it, it must be. But they haven't fallen off since. I would like, you know, the standard ones are still on there. I'm, I got rid of the GTI 6 brakes actually because the calipers were huge. They weighed so much. It had massive, huge brakes on it, lots of unsprung weight. And I thought, well, it weighs 900 odd kilos. Why do I need 280 mil discs on the front? I don't race it. And if you're talking about racing, the kids in the Junior Saloon Car Championship who race VTRs have standard brakes. And they handle racing. So as the first car on the dyno in 2013, it was the first car to get Evans waterless coolant in 2015. That's now been in there nine years. Well, it did come out for a bit, but it's gone back in. So it's the same coolant it got nine years ago. First car I ever converted. Um, one of the reasons I chose this car was because I knew this car was tough and it could take it if I balled something up. So, uh, yeah, this car's been a nice little car for experimenting. Been a bit of a guinea pig. It started to spend a bit of time between 2015 and 2019-ish off the road and on the road. And my wife got a job in this time, and so she really could have used an everyday car. In fact, she was, I can't remember what she was taking to work at the time, but basically we had an intermittent cutting out problem on this car and it kind of it, it sat in a garage for a year or so didn't know what to do with it didn't know what the problem was threw a parts can and it fired absolutely every part we could think of and it didn't do it no fault codes no clues nothing it would just randomly cut out so in the end she went off to look to see about new cars she was looking at mini she was looking at sport car she was looking for stuff like that something small to fit in a small parking space at work before i rem reminded her you own a small car. Why don't we try fixing it? So it came back out. She started using the car and in 2019, it had its second major, if you like. Um, the back end had been done. This time it was, it was the biggest amount of work I'd done. Front end, engine out, lots of welding to the front end, um, power flex bushes, gear linkages, cooling system, God knows what, done so much to the front of that car. Um, lots and lots and lots of welding, um, different headlights. We put the VTR wheels back on it. She had originally put VTS wheels on in about 2005. Um, and we say VTS wheels, we actually bought them from Azara. Went to Leicester to get them and uh, they were like 120 quid because they were Citroen Zara wheels. If you'd sold them a Saxo VTS wheels, they would have been 300, 350, something like that. They had the wrong size tires on admittedly, but so they were fitted and then they came back off in 2019 because it drives better on these wheels. And these, I think these wheels are so good looking. I think they're one of the best looking standard wheels on a standard car that you'll find. So it had its major in 2019 and returned to the road full time as a daily. We were hoping we'd solved the problem. The cutting out 
is gone. Took it to France in 2019. It went to Rems. It went to oh, Ram. Ram. Uh, it went. Uh, yeah, we took it on a trip to Belgium. We took it all round, and the uh, cutting out problem reared its ugly head. It came back, going around the Arc de Triomphe. Of all the places it could come back, that was great. That was really helpful, that one. Um, took it to France, took it back to Aulnay, um, where it was made. We took it home. We took it back to the, the factory site, because the factory is now rubble. Um, but we took it back to the factory site it was made. It's kind of sad, in a way. Now, in 2020, there was a minor health issue, um, and this car came off the road. We saw this car along with... In fact, we only had one car on the road with everything, because you couldn't go out, so you couldn't really use them. Um, it was parked up off the road and in that time managed to find out what the cutting out problem was. It was a dicky ECU. Changed the ECU, problem gone. It was about 2020 when my wife, it kind of dawned on her that she'd had this car for so long that it might actually start making the transition from being a kind of old daily car to modern classic. So in 2020, she started hatching plans to take it to shows and things like that. In 2022, it suffered the indignity of being rescued by Cecily. Uh, yeah, the throttle cable snapped on this car. And so Cecily had to go and recover it. Um, and in 2023, you may have seen this car. Well, it, it went to two events. You might have seen it at Radwood. It was there. And you may have also seen it at Super Touring Power at Brands Hatch. Um, there was a lineup of 90s cars, which is quite a good idea. A little parade, a little... little sort of alley of 90s cars and uh, this car was in that lineup so yeah it went there so all of that that list of events story list of events whatever what's so special go back to the beginning of the videos so it's not clickbait what's this about this car is still on the road it's still doing daily service and today the day this video was uploaded which is the 10th of january 2024 it will be exactly 20 years to the day she bought it. It's the 20th anniversary today. She's owned this car 20 years. It doesn't actually look that much different either. That's the funny thing. It is still wearing the same number plates, same wheels, same everything, really. Different headlights, different interior. Well, I'll go through the mods another time. That's 20 years with a Saxo.